I was attending the University of Florida my uh, freshman year in 1964, and I was going scuba diving. That was my hobby at the time. So I was driving on a road near Gainesville, Florida, and a parachute landed in the road in front of me. So I stopped and picked the guy up. I almost ran over him, took him back to the Williston Airport, and he talked me into jumping. Two hours later, there I was. Uh, front mounted gear, static line, I didn't know much. Uh, we had a target that was a, a large 28-foot circular parachute, and he told me that the cows like to come stand on it, and I should yell and scream at 100 feet to scare off the cows and look for the circle of cows. That's where I was to land. Anyway, everything worked well. I wasn't scared at all. I was 18. But it hit so hard uh, that it just knocked me out. And when I woke up, my jump master was uh, kicking this cow and pulling the parachute out of his mouth. He was eating it. Anyway, he got it out, and believe it or not, we wiped the slobber off, and I made another jump. So fast forward 30 years later, and this guy walks up and says, do you remember me? And I went, yeah, you put me out in my first jump. You never forget that face. And I asked when it was, because I didn't remember the exact date, and he said, I got the logbook. So we went and looked, and I got scared to death 30 years later. Because there it was, Jump Master Bill Booth, and I looked over, and the guy had six jumps. That was the most experienced person around at the time. Things are different now. Okay, so that's the first jump story. That's, awesome. yeah. that's great. Yeah. That's great. So tell me, tell me a little bit um, how you made your career in, in skydiving. Well, I was a, a music major, and uh, I was going to join the Air Force. I wanted to be an astronaut, fly jets, and uh, that was the way to do it. Uh, so I signed up for the Air Force after I got out of college, but I got an education degree uh, in music. And so waiting to go my delayed enlistment, I uh, became a band director. That's what I was trained to do in Miami. And after doing that for about a year, I'm about ready to go into the uh, service. And the Vietnam War conveniently ended, and they didn't need, need any more pilots. So I got an honorable discharge without leaving home. And all the time when I'd been um, band directing during the day, I was teaching at night, Tuesday and Thursday classes, jumping all weekend at the drop zone. It was really a seven-day-a-week job. And uh, I started building gear for my students because I didn't like what I could get, you know, just pack packs for them pretty much. And, uh, and then I built a rig for myself. And I showed up at DeLand one year, and a, it was a different kind of rig, very new kind of looking stuff, hand deploy, that kind of stuff. No one had seen it before. And this guy said, wow, where can you get that? And I said, well, it's just mine. Uh, and he said, well, can I buy it? And I went, uh, he said, I'll give you 100 bucks. And I went, okay. So I gave it to him, and I went home, built another one. And I went, hey, this is easy money. You know, I don't have any kids yelling at me. So within a year, I'd given up the teaching, and I had five employees. And we make about five rigs a week. We were all jumpers. We'd each build one of our own completely. And uh, it grew from there now to over 100 employees and making a lot more rigs. As a matter of fact, we're uh, closing in on rig number 60,000 now. Quite a few. Quite a few. Yeah. Can you tell me about the first time you went up and, and used a throw-out pilot shoot? Yeah, an interesting story. Um, I started jumping uh, ram airs, and to have a, it was a ring and rope reefing system before the slider, and you needed a lot of drag in the pilot chute, so we'd put two pilot chutes on, and they didn't jump very well when you pull the ripcord. One would jump one way, one would jump the other, so very often I'd have to reach behind my back and throw them out. So I got tired of that, and I said, why don't I do my last ditch emergency effort first? So I took a pilot chute, took the spring out, and put it in my blue jean pocket. Uh, and I said, I'm just going to go and I'm just going to throw the thing out first thing, you know, instead of later when it hesitates. And no one would go in the airplane with me, I remember. There's something about not wanting to fill out the fatality report. But anyway, I jumped, and that was a peak experience. It worked just great, and I went, hey, this is neat. No more pilot shoot hesitations. Jumpers nowadays don't know what they are, but sometimes when you pull the ripcord, nothing happened for a second or two or three, and it got really scary. So anyway, that fixed that, and I was happy with that. <coughs> yeah. So... That's hand deploy story. And then uh, as parachutes got more high tech and malfunctions got more high tech, uh, the old pull and punch method where you were under a round, you had a malfunction, which would be generally slow and not spinning very much. You just open the reserve and shake it out like a bed sheet. Didn't work. People started breaking away, but the capo releases in the shoulders took six motions. Open the covers, find the rings, stick your thumbs in the rings, and pull. And sometimes one went and sometimes one didn't. So it became obvious 
that we needed a single point release, something that would release a malfunction quickly. And this is before the squares that have really spinny bad malfunctions. Uh, a lot of people were trying to, and I came up with four or five different uh, single point releases before I happened on the three ring release. And the rings are round so they cannot misalign. And I made my release uh, at a cost of about $100 in raw materials, the first one. By comparison, the cape wall release that it replaced cost over a million dollars in research and development costs in 1949. So uh, this was a cheap thing, and, and 40 years later, it's still being used, which I'm amazed, actually, that three ring is still the only way to go. Unless you're the U.S. Army and you still use cape wells, but what can I say? You know? <laughs> So you hold the patent on the three ring? Yeah, hand deploy pilot shoot, pull out pilot shoot, and three ring. Um, I, within the first year or two of jumping, there were a bunch of things that bugged me about skydiving. And one was pilot shoot hesitations, and the second became the cape wells. I didn't like them very much. And the third thing that really got to me was kicking students out static line. I trained maybe a thousand people static line. And some of them were kind of spacey, and you know, when I gave them the boot out the door, I was scared to death that if anything happened, they'd die, because I couldn't help them anymore. And I said, why can't we take people with us, the same as we learn to fly or drive, you don't do that alone. But the gear wasn't up to it. The uh, round parachutes, there was no way you could take two people, unless you got a really big one. And uh, we had to wait. I had to wait till square parachutes and piggybacks. You needed a piggyback. A front mount reserve, you couldn't do a tandem jump. You got to put a person there where the reserve was. We needed piggybacks. We needed ram airs that would uh, pack small enough so that two that would carry two people to the ground would fit in the back of one person. My first ram air rig weighed 55 pounds solo. And now our tandem rigs only weigh 45. So I had to wait. Since I came up with the idea I wanted to do tandem, I had to wait for almost 20 years for the gear to catch up and be good enough. And actually, I did make a tandem jump under a round parachute. Several of us did. Paragear had a sail, 44-foot cargo chute, which you would drop a Jeep with, uh, for $44. So I bought one, and it didn't come with the deployment device, so I found a large duffel bag, probably five or six feet tall. We stuffed it in there. Two of us with piggybacks faced each other, and we tied the risers around our chest straps, tied us together, and we went out holding on with a hook knife in either hand. And we had a third person in the Cessna that held the bag. So when we jumped out, it just, parachute came out of the bag, there we were. And we did that a couple times, and it, it was kind of fun. No control, just landed out there in the Everglades. But on one of my early jumps with it, kind of put my tandem to sleep for a while, the guy holding the bag in the airplane dropped it, and there I am in free fall with this guy looking at each other, and here comes the bag with the parachute still in it next to us. And I remember yelling at me, you didn't tell me about this, Booth. What are we supposed to do now? So we went working on the hook knives and managed to cut both of our chest straps in half. But we lived through it because we had the old piggybacks with belly bands, and that kept us in an opening. And um, the next tandem jump came in uh, 1977. We had a 11-year-old kid in the drop zone who was cerebral palsy. His uh, parents were skydivers, and so we decided that uh, since he didn't weigh very much and one of my employees, Mike Barber, didn't weigh very much. The two of them weighed about the same as me together. I took my rig and put some harnesses on it and we built a small harness for this guy named Kirk, called him Sky Kirk after the jump and put him in an 11th way, 11 way on his 11th birthday because we didn't think he was going to live very long anyway. And the good part of the story is, is he's now in his 40s. He made it. But he used to sit in the wheelchair and just go like this, you know, and we're thinking he wants to go. That's so we took him and, and the first time we really saw him smile was in free fall. Kid loved it. And it was by 1983, the gear got big enough, mostly developed uh, to take military rucksacks, that Ted Strong and I both took our secretaries in the summer of 1983 on tandem jumps, and that started it. And now you know millions of people do it a year. So anyway, that's the story of tandem jumping and hand deploying the three-ring release. And uh, the other thing I've done is the skyhook, which gets your reserve out very quick. I noticed with static lines, when we went from the pilot shoot assist, where the static line opened the rig and it maybe helped the pilot shoot a little bit to the direct bags where the, the whole canopy and lines were pulled away from the student jumper that the student couldn't get unstable fast enough to entangle in the reserve lines. So I said I want to do that with the, um, I want to do that with the reserve parachute. So I want to make the main parachute the airplane and do a direct bag static line with the reserve. But I couldn't figure out how to do it because of total malfunctions. You can't just tie them together. It's got to decide in a split second 
when you need your reserve, is it a total or a partial? So it took me almost 20 years to figure that one out. And now the Skyhawk's been out 10 years. So uh, I'm happy with the way it's working also. So those are, I think, my main contributions to the sport. No. All right, so I got a question for you. If someone's oh. in the museum right now and they're not a skydiver and they're just looking at the museum and they're maybe thinking about making a skydive, mm. what would you say to that person about making a skydive and why? Well, making a skydive is, is a reasonable decision now. When I started, it was kind of crazy. It was populated by young men. There were practically no women because they couldn't pick up the gear. And women generally don't do stupid things that men do driven by testosterone, I guess. Uh, when someone quit jumping and the normal, you know, jump career went one, 200 jumps before your legs were so messed up you couldn't jump anymore, we'd kind of like burn their parachute, you know, and, and that was the end of it. But now with lightweight gear, and gear, by the way, for all the women, gear was one color. It was olive drab, or it was black if you dyed it in the bathtub. So there was no pretty colors. That kept the women out too, with a few exceptions. It had to be a really tough woman to want to skydive back then. Um, now the gear is small, and with tandem jumping, it's a reasonable thing to do. When I started jumping, uh, the fatality rate for maybe 3,500 members in, in the United Parachute Association uh, was about 50 or 60 a year. Now the fatality rate with 35,000 members is 25 a year. And most of those are self-inflicted landing a perfectly functioning parachute badly because people like to jump little parachutes and make radical maneuvers close to the ground. So compared to when I started jumping with my jump master with six jumps, you now go with a tandem system that has a fatality rate of close to one in a million jumps and with an instructor that has a minimum of 500 jumps before he's allowed to even touch you. So now it's a sensible thing to do. And uh, the majority of people that make tandem jumps are in fact women now. And that proves it, <laughs> I think. And tandem has made it so that just about anyone, we've taken people out of wheelchairs, uh, people up to 100 years old have made tandem jumps. Um, now anyone can experience so so making a tandem jump you'll find out if it's for you you'll get out there you'll see what free fall is like you won't have to know i uh, won't have to guess and you'll know and then you can go on from there so now it's not that big a deal to make a, a skydive the danger is still there we have a fatality rate but it's been reduced by a factor of 10 to 20 uh, by the modern equipment and especially tandem jumping so now it's a sane thing to do okay. right. thank you so much my pleasure I know you can tell me story after story, and I'd love to hear some more. A lot of them. A lot of them. Let me get this off of you here. I know there's a dinner coming up, but... Um, yeah. Um, I talked to you a couple of times. The, uh, I told you some of those.